goal originally articulated in a message to the direct, from the directors to the membership five years ago expresses a commitment to listening and responding to those with diverse points of view. For the International Cultic Studies Association, this means listening and responding with respect to those who have left a wide array of cults, to those who come from many different kinds of families within and outside of cults, to those who remain in cults, and to those who are professionals, including clinicians, researchers, attorneys, clergy, and journalists. In their message, the directors hope to overcome and move beyond polarization that had existed for years between ICSA members and those not in ICSA who held contrasting views of high demand groups. Members of ICSA generally define high demand groups as destructive cults and emphasize harm to cult members. Others, mainly sociologists, define high demand groups as new religious movements and generally focus on the group practices as neutral social phenomena rather than on the effect the groups had on its members. <coughs> also, in the early years of ICSA, formerly the American Family Foundation, the typical view, particularly expressed by mental health professionals outside, was that people join cultic groups because of some weakness of character or because they were separating from troubled families. Early ICSA members fought back against this blame the victim approach. We believe that manipulative leaders with narcissistic agendas deceive people who were recruited into cults. Family members like myself were relieved to learn about the cult dynamics that were in large measure responsible for otherwise inexplicable changes in our loved ones when they became recruits. Over time, ICSA began to see potential for cult recruitment in a more complex way both individual as well as stage of life vulnerability and cult manipulation and other factors as well have their role. Each might provide important information in helping to explain the cult phenomenon. A more nuanced understanding help move our organization to a less polarized view and led to an increased willingness to reach out to those with differing viewpoints. In their message, which can be found on the ICSA website, the directors state the following. The benefits of dialogue are the converse of the negative effects of polarization. Communication increases knowledge, broadens perspectives, and enhances one capacity to understand and appreciate the complex interpersonal dynamics of people who have left or are still in cultic groups and might help us better relate to those who have endured. When groups of helpers and researchers with different perspectives and foci have open boundaries, people belonging to those disciplines will feel less pressure to conform and conversely will feel freer to pursue new ideas or innovative approaches to treatment. 
when one has regular contact to those holding differing views, one is more likely to recognize one's opinions as opinions and not mistakenly treat them as facts. When boundaries between helpers and researchers are open and characterized by much border traffic, cross-border traffic, dubious groups or dubious individuals within groups cannot so easily exploit the situation. I agree with this message, which has value not only for our organization, but also for the wider world. I believe in general that conflict can be a healthy phenomenon and dealing with it can help each of us gain new insight into others as well as ourselves. However, Ixa also believes in the free choice and safety of our members. Today, I am talking about dialogue. I am not talking about subjecting yourself to a person whose goal is to manipulate or intimidate Nothing I will say today is meant to encourage you to permit yourself to be exploited or bullied. Although Ixa sees the value in being able to engage respectfully in dialogue with people who have different perspectives, we also recognize that some views of our people attempt to violate the human rights and dignity of others. In these cases, it is wise for us not to engage. IMSA conferences provide an open arena for people from different backgrounds with diverse points of view. At our conference, opinions expressed by those who are speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ICSO or its directors, staff, uh, advisors, or supporters. Today we can celebrate the fact that conference attendees see the issue of psychological manipulation and abuse in cults in differing ways. The philosophy articulated by its directors that being part of the ICSA community will involve disagreements over perceptions, beliefs, and goals, not only with people outside ICSA, but also within our own organization. Over the years, the population of ICSA has changed dramatically. Growing numbers of people born and raised in cults have entered our network. At the same time, ICSA has welcomed the increased numbers of mental health professionals, researchers, clergy, journalists, and attorneys who are interested in cultic issues. Each of these groups has emerged to articulate their own particular perspective, beliefs, and goals. How do we deal with this new reality? How do we ensure that each population respects the others and is respected itself? In today's presentation, I will consider some factors that undermine dialogue and I will suggest some ideas that might help us connect our black and white world. As a psychoanalyst, my perspective is that unconscious as well as conscious factors always are at play in our interaction with others and that these factors can undermine dialogue. For example, when I was asked to give this plenary, I became aware of a certain degree of anxiety about your reaction to my presentation. <laughs> I allowed myself to consider 
what might be underlying my anxiety? I began to understand that I imagined you would have a critical reaction. To comfort myself, I challenged my black and white emotional thinking with self-reflection gained from years of my own therapy and from the use of self-analysis that has been central tool to my work as a therapist. Moving from an emotional to a self-reflective state allowed me to calm down and I had the following thoughts. First, even if many of you respond critically, in contrast to situations in my early life, today I'm pretty good about accepting criticism. So it was unlikely that I would be crushed by your reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Second, although some of you might take issue with some of my ideas, Others might possibly have a positive reaction to some of what I say. Third, my self-esteem would increase simply if I took the uncomfortable action of presenting rather than declining to speak. These thoughts move me from an emotional state to self-reflection and help me shift from viewing myself as the potential victim of your crushing reaction <laughs> to a more balanced and hopefully realistic view. In light of this, I began to consider Jessica Benjamin's concept of the third. Benjamin suggests that too often we divide our emotional world between feeling like a victim who is done to or the victimizer who is the doer. We are stuck in right, wrong, dominant, submissive, binary thinking. We see this kind of thinking today in world leaders who would negotiate as if everything is a zero sum game. Their attitude is, if you win, I lose. The only way to go up is for others to go down. Benjamin believes that instead, by using self-reflection, we can claim an equal place within our relationship with others. Instead of a divided way of seeing the world, we can approach new situations in such a way <coughs> that everyone has the possibility of gaining something from the experience. Earlier I talked about my anxiety when I first considered giving this plenary address. In psychoanalytic terms, in making an assumption about the audience's reactions, I was experiencing a transference reaction transference expectation. That is, instead of looking at all possible outcomes, my sense of reality became limited by my expectation that you would react in a manner similar to reactions I experienced in my early life. Transference is a core concept of psychoanalysis. It means that unconsciously we transfer attitudes and expectations developed in the past in our, to our present life and relationships. A psychoanalytic approach focuses on transference and centers upon how we might distort our present relationships based upon how we view relationships in the past. Often these expectations are developed in childhood when our thinking tends to be black and white, lacking the nuance and subtlety we gain as we mature. 
by transference expectations can also form as a result of important relationships made later in life, particularly in traumatic relationships. Transference also can lead us to possibly mishearing or misunderstanding each other, and this misperception can undermine successful communication. This happens because our past constantly reshape how we view our present. Former cult members may have an expectation, both conscious and unconscious, that new relationships will repeat the victim-victimizer dynamics that occurred in the cult. However, as you can see by my example, you don't have to be a former member of a cult to have these particular expectations. While some individuals here, including myself, never were in the cult, as anxious humans, we all are vulnerable to regress into black and white thinking of childhood that cults intensify. With transference expectations, we can make assumptions and fill in the gaps in what we know about who people are and what they are thinking. This limits our ability to see others as we are not seeing the real person before us, an individual with strengths and flaws. Likewise, with transference expectations, we limit our ability to see ourselves in a more complex and realistic way. When we contrast ourselves to an idealized cult leader, therapist, or others, we magnify our own shortcomings. Conversely, when we need to protect ourselves, we can become suspicious and expect nothing but bad from others. When we see ourselves and others in a more balanced manner, we can acknowledge our flaws without losing sight of our strengths. So how do we move from a reactive and defensive response that incorporates black and white expectation that either we will be badly treated by a powerful other, or we'll be speaking with an idiot or an arrogant jerk. <laughs> How do we handle powerful emotions, such as dread or anger, that might have originated in our early life, or in the cult, or both? and replace these emotions with a response of thoughtful curiosity. <laughs> How do we do that? <laughs> well, Benjamin has the answer. <laughs> Benjamin suggests that we encounter people with different and even opposing views from ours. We need to recognize our own participation in this conflict, and this will allow us to negotiate our differences and to connect. In other words, if we pause, taking a breath, and give ourselves the time to consider that we might be having a transference reaction, such as in the readiness to see ourselves as victims in an experience. We can begin to see alternative ways of looking at a situation. This recognition might allow us to feel less avoidant or hopeless about a potential interaction. We can view self-reflection as a process that provides us with the mental space for thinking things through. I can use my own self-reflection and internal conversation as a stepping stone to figure out
how I can best see the situation more realistically to converse with others without being defensive. After years of personal therapy, I sometimes can take the step. However, I very often slip and stay immersed in emotion. This is a hard thing to do. I know that I'm not the only one who struggles with this issue. This step into thinking might be particularly difficult for those who have been involved in past relationships where we're asserting a contrary, contradictory point of view was dangerous and could lead to punishment or shaming. Whether it was through a tyrannical parent, a manipulative partner, or a narcissistic <coughs> cult leader, many people have learned that the only way to survive was through dissociation, are other forms of defense against prohibited force, thoughts. This might make it difficult to gain conscious awareness of transference expectations, of punishment and shame. It can be hard for all of us to move from a world where the only one person can be right into a world of ambiguity where there can be a myriad of rights. Even if it is risky, I believe that when we attempt to understand those who are different from us, we have the possibility of expanding our sense of reality. In many circumstances, we can gain from showing flexibility of thinking and empathy. We don't have to fear subjecting our identity to others or becoming stuck in their viewpoint. Rigidly held views undermine the possibility for a richer understanding of our world. We're family and group oriented. Our desire to be part of a group has aided our survival and has it been adaptive for different species and for the human race? Our, the danger is that we are apt to experience positive feelings about the groups to which we belong and less positive feelings about those groups to which we don't. We tend to see our own groups as superior to others. Cult leaders prey upon these emotions to cement loyalty to the group. Our sense of vulnerability can cause us to identify more powerfully with our own group. When there is trouble between groups, in order to feel safe, we tend to retreat to our own. While entrenched in our own groups, we might be more apt to see members of other groups in stereotypical ways instead of seeing them as individuals. Stereotyping works in a similar way to transference. We react to someone based on expectations we have developed in the past. In marital therapy, sometimes when one partner in a relationship lacks understanding of the other, it is important to identify how a diverse culture might be influencing the behavior and meaning of each partner's experiences to increase the couple's awareness of some of the roadblocks in their interaction. Depathologizing behaviors by seeing their connection to past experiences can reduce shame in one partner while increasing understanding in the other. It is vital in this process to avoid applying cultural stereotypes to either partner. Even when one partner is behaving in ways that might be considered typical of this culture, it is important to understand the particular ways in which he internalized certain aspects of the culture and how this internalization 
is influencing his behavior and his experience of others. The director's dialogue of 2015 addresses the human tendency to stereotype as a hindrance to listening to a person with a divergent viewpoint. They write, Stereotyping can provide short-term comfort, for it requires less thought than analysis that recognizes the complex dynamics of cultic groups. But stereotyping inevitably leads to polarization, which reinforces stereotyping. More useful than labels are questions followed by good faith discussion. What does he say is more fruitful question than in what category does she belong? If we simply view groups as central indicators of identity, we can form conclusions about an individual that might be mistaken. I will describe myself as an example of this. I joined ICSA because I am the older sister of a former cult member. I am a Jewish clinical social worker who also is a psychoanalyst. I live in New Jersey and I am a proud member of the Democratic Party. My identity has been shaped to some degree by all these groups and I suspect that those of you who don't know me may form instant positive or negative impressions about me based upon what you just heard. We might be ready to dismiss the inside of a person based on our impressions about outer criteria, but this can provide us with false understanding of others. I would say more important than any of these outward descriptions is my character, the person who I am inside. It might tell you more about me if you knew that as a young child I spoke with a lisp, in part because of reactions to this. I became a very shy child. This list is connected to my anxiety today about public speaking. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I spent my childhood immersed in books, and I reached out to those books that resonated within me. Reading and loving all the Nancy Drew books allowed a shy girl to imagine what it would feel like to be an adolescent who bravely plowed ahead to solve all sorts of mysteries with her friends. Mysteries taught me private problem solving and sparked my natural curiosity and wonder about the mysteries of the human mind. In early adolescence, I read about another early <coughs> adolescence. I, adolescent, I read The Diary of Anne Frank. This book allowed me to appreciate the importance of positive relationships, even the relationship with a diary, to deal with terrifying times. After having made friends with many different people and in literature, ICSA has allowed me to make friends with many different people living throughout the United States and throughout the world. This has been one of the many benefits of ICSA. Although we might look different on the outside and speak different languages, we share many common values and interests. Having friends from many different cultures, religions, and ethnicities, even some Republicans, <laughs> has broadened my perspective in a way that would have been lost if I simply made friendships for my own demographic. Encountering diversity has allowed me to see myself 
than others. I believe that the ICSA community offers the opposite of ethnocentrism. While this is a time of increasing ethnocentrism in the world, we might consider that instead of using cultural differences simply as a tool to dehumanize and claim superiority over others, exploration of cultural differences can be a starting point for gaining insight into our own biases and inner beliefs. An example of dialogue between subgroups. As many of you know, my husband Bill and I have facilitated a support group for former cult members at our home for 40, over 40 years. In the last years, our support group members have included many people born and raised in cult groups, as well as former cultists who became parents in cult groups. Initially, transference attitudes initiated strong, unspoken emotions between these two groups. Two of the cult parents who expected to be blamed the, uh, by the other group members for cult treatment of children describe feelings of shame, guilt, despair, and regret for harm to their children while in the group. Those born and raised in cults who previously had the cult, the transference expectation that the cult parents would minimize cult harm, instead began to feel empathy for the cult parents. This discussion helped former cult member parents deal with their feelings of shame, and former members born into cults deal with their feelings of anger. Things aren't always as we perceive them to be. It takes time to understand another person. And we have to resist thinking we know when we actually are in the process of learning. I need to remind myself that if I say she's a typical mental health professional, researcher, attorney, or clergy, Cleric, I am dehumanizing and stereotyping the person before me, even if I say it with affection. If I theorize about a cult person or situation too quickly, I am using a shorthand method and may be missing the boat. Theories may make us feel more comfortable by giving us the feeling that we know, but we do a disservice to the people with whom we are interacting, interacting. As a therapist, I believe that my clients should bring me to the theory rather than the other way around. In other words, we should not let our expectations shape our reality. Why are we talking now? So why are dialogue and diversity necessary? In the days ahead, we will each be interacting with individuals who may have vastly different backgrounds and possibly even views that are opposed to our own. I would say, based upon my decades in this organization, that the people you meet here, no matter how different they seem, can all actually be seen to some extent as heroes for their tremendous achievements. They are first generation former cult members who were courageous enough to leave despite hearing frightened stories of the outside world and despite having to face the painful fact that they have given over years to a false messiah. 
They are second and multi-generational former cult members who, despite the need to adapt to a whole new culture, bravely left the only world they had ever known. They are families who are intrepid in finding different ways to keep contact with those in the cult and thus assuring their loved ones that they will have a caring home on the outside. They are mental health professionals who often for a low fee have made it possible for former cult members to tell their story. They are attorneys who have fought for cult members' rights, former cult members' rights. They are researchers who have provided us with good science and who have written eloquently about the dynamics of these groups and the after effects of cult life. They are clergy who have helped former cult members deconstruct how cult scripture has twisted mainstream Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, or Islamic belief. They are journalists who have told the stories of those who have been harmed. They may be sociologists or even representatives of cultic groups who come here openly, taking the courageous step of entering these halls, filled with people who generally might be opposed to them or their views. The except directors write, uh-oh, you'll never know. Dialogue is premised on humility. If I deem myself to be imperfect, value truth, and have a set of beliefs, then I ought to be open to discussion with those who do not share these beliefs. I cannot correct myself if I do not allow myself to be challenged. We need diversity in dialogue. Because as intelligent or educated or experienced as we may be, we don't know everything. We need to recognize our vulnerabilities and our blind spots. We will only be able to hear one another if we move past assumptions and our self-righteousness. Instead, we need to be humble, remembering that we all are equals to deserving respect. Let's remember that the person who might have just said something that appears to be offensive or ridiculous might be opening the door into a new way of seeing the world. Thank you.